Hello and welcome back to the Impact Lounge and your weekly Impact Review. I'm your host, Adam, and as always, I'm joined by Ro. How you doing, Ro? How you doing, Adam? Really good, really good. Early morning here, late night for you. Should be an interesting show, but I'm sure we'll push through the tiredness on both our ends. So uh, thank you to all our listeners, as always, for giving us likes and uh, tuning in each and every week. Uh, Please do continue to do so, and uh, we will reward you with uh, our usual nonsense talking about impact review and trivia questions and the like. But if this is your first time stopping by the channel, please do make sure you hit that subscribe button and uh, share the link as best as you can, just so we can get more listeners, which will in turn attract more uh, pro wrestlers to come on the show and do interviews with us. Although at the moment, uh, most of the content on the channel is about impact reviews, we are doing other shows as well. And going forward, uh, we are going to have much more regular content. Uh, we're just getting a few, few things at the moment, such as looking at redesigning our website, those kind of things. But make sure you hit subscribe because there is a good a lot, uh, there's a lot of good content on the channel. Um, yes, yeah, so every week before we jump into the show, we usually answer some of the listeners' questions as well as answering, uh, asking you guys a trivia question each week. So uh, let's let's tackle the trivia question first, and I'll, I'll give you the answer to last week. So the clues were uh, they were a former Ring of Honor world champion, they were British, and they formed a tag team in TNA with another British world champion. And the final clue was... I was commissioner of Explosion. And many of you did get it right and said Desmond Wolf or Nigel McGuinness. But a few of you did get it wrong and didn't get the second part of the question, which was what was the name of the tag team? And it was indeed London's Brawling, which um, I've interviewed both Nigel McGuinness and Magnus a few times. And uh, both of them said it was amazing that they always get asked about London's Brawling, even though they only tagged together for about two months. Uh, they said it, it's quite often the thing that they get asked about uh, during interviews. So uh, if, like me, you really enjoyed the team, uh, it's, it's a shame that Desmond Wolf was only in uh, TNA, as it was at the time, for a very, very short time. So there you go. Well done to all of those who got it right. Uh, I'll just double check now as we're speaking, actually, who was the first one. I've got a feeling it might have been either Car- Cardination or Willow Flood, one of those two. But for the time being, I'll, hold, I'll hand you over to Ro, who's going to ask this week's question. And I've got to say, if you get it right this week, it's a toughie. So over to you, Ro. All right. Before I get in, I just want to ask real quick. Part of his departure, uh, Desmond Wolf, it had didn't it have something to do with his health. Yeah, he um, he had hepatitis B, I believe, um, and uh, which he claims he got from a dirty ring in TNA from people juicing too much, you know, and blooding, uh, you know, having too much blood. So he's been a big uh, proponent of of people not, you know, of, of not bleeding during matches. <laughs> Um, it's since cleared up, and he's since been cleared. Uh, he's actually a really interesting guy. Uh, I've interviewed him two, three times, and funnily enough, we did a joint interview with him and Grado at one point, which was quite fun. Um, but yeah, he, he left because of that, and then uh, within the year, to cl- I didn't know the hepatitis B could clear up, to be honest. But yeah, he was he was pronounced clear a little bit later on. So um, I think he he returned then as Bring of Honor Commissioner. Uh, for a while certainly on the booking committee and now i believe he does commentary for 205 live is it or i'm not sure i think he does commentary these days for wwe in some in some form yeah, that's interesting all right anyways so it, but yeah, it was it was a uh, cardination 420 who said uh, uh nigel mcginnis and london brawling with magnus although both willow and cardination uh you know they were very very close together and they both said nigel mcginnis well I was looking for Desmond Wolf, so you were both wrong. (laughs) I'm only joking. Well done, guys. All right. uh, With my trivia question this week, once again, who am I? Uh, The three clues I'm going to give you is clue number one. I've been a part of three different tag teams who've captured tag team championships. Clue number two, I was a part of one of the biggest, if not the biggest group in professional wrestling. And finally, the move that I use or have used in the past if you were to have too many of these in real life you might find yourself unconscious or blacked out i should say who am i there you go folks it's a tough one this week and i've got to say i'll be very impressed if uh, more than a handful of you get it but 
Get it, you will try, without wanting to sound like Yoda there. Right, so hit the like if you're stopping by the channel for the first time or the subscribe. We want to get the the thumbs up or even the thumbs down. We don't really care as long as there is feedback. Um, last week's show, we had um, less viewers than usual, but there you go, that's impact for you. Their ratings go up and down. So did ours last week, but I'm sure we'll bounce back with a strong show this week. So the other thing that we do uh, is we answer our listeners questions so we've got one each row do you want to go with your one first today certainly um, i'm gonna go with uh, richard cartledge uh question and his was do do we think that impact wrestling is being over relying on undefeated streaks to push wrestlers i don't think it's impact i mean maybe wrestling in general it's something that they do i think that's their way of any company and i'm not just saying just with impact that's kind of like their way to introduce a character especially when they're talking about a monster character i i don't think it's so much over reliant i think what ends up happening is uh promotions they end up uh running out of ideas you know you have wrestlers you know beat a couple of people then when they're ready to face you know whether it's a main event star or somebody who's a champion and the company's not ready to put the title on you know said wrestler then you know we get some kind of funny finish but then too you know you see like i'll use a prime example you think about a couple weeks ago with tessa i would have thought tessa would have been somebody that they would have brought in and you know she would have gotten a couple matches up underneath her belt before she eventually loses i mean she lost her second match so i don't want to say it's so much of an over reliance i just think that's their way to kind of get the audience to get behind said wrestler yeah I, I, just to add to that i can't actually think of anyone who has got an undefeated streak at the moment uh certainly not in, in impact because brian cage obviously had one and, and he lost this week so uh, I don't think there is an over-reliance, and I think if it's used right, it, it can be very powerful. But the problem that you have is when you have someone like Crimson, who has a year-long undefeated streak, and then gets uh, you know taken out in 30 seconds by James Storm. I think if you're going to do an undefeated streak, you really have to have a major payoff and, and some value in, in the person beating that, that character. So um, what did you think of Crimson, by the way, in his undefeated streak? Did, did you consider that a success, Ro? Not really, because when I'm comparing, and you know, I hate to compare because everyone wrestle, every wrestler is different, but I always look at undefeated streaks as when it's supposed to culminate, it's supposed to be in a title match. So, if they, you know, when I look at Goldberg, for example, who went undefeated up until he actually won the championship and then lost i think he won the mid card belt the united states belt and he relinquished it then won the world title and when he lost his, his uh finally his first loss he lost the title i i just think when you have undefeated streaks and you know especially when they go for a year and within that year that said wrestler hasn't really been in any type of title contention just kind of just been in the background here and there then it's weak because you look at the payoff with crimson after he lost that match to james storm he really essentially was never the same yeah, yeah absolutely and it's a shame i quite like crimson um not so much when he was a singles wrestler but i liked him in ov not ov sorry um soldiers of what was the, what were they called? Uh, Veterans of War. Veterans of War. Can think of VOW. Yeah, I, I quite like that tactic. I think that had a lot of legs, and and especially in the LA, LAX feud, you know, uh, American team going up against you know a, a Latin team like that. I think there was legs in that feud. There, there, there was a lot they could have done with them, and I was surprised when they released them. Well, they didn't really release them. They just disappeared off our screens, didn't they? So it was a bit of a strange one. That anyway. Thanks for the question. Um, the one that I'm going to go for this week is from Luke Avery. Luke, thank you very much for your question. He asked about the commentary team because it's, it's something that I bring up uh, a lot on this show, uh, saying about you know when Sanjay was doing it and before him, I can't even remember who was who was before him. Um, and I, I talk about it all the time, saying you know that I think it's either weak or it's good. Uh, and the current incarnation of, of of Josh and Don Callis, I think, is excellent. But uh, he asks. Uh, if you could choose one well-known person to replace Josh Matthews on commentary, who would it be? And he went for Taneo Jim Ross. Uh, Josh Matthews is all right, but his dream team would be one of those two with Don Callis. So have you got any thoughts on this one, Ro? Um, I guess if I had to say, you know, one of my favorite announcers was Joey Styles. So dream scenario, I would say Joey Styles and Don West 
you know, former Don West who used to commentate in the earlier TNA. <laughs> I don't know how those guys, those two would do together, but I just th loved how enthusiastic they were on the, on the mic. I, I agree with you. I think Don West is fantastic. And it wasn't at Slammiversary for a couple of matches last year for memory as well. Uh, I think he came back, didn't need to do one or two uh, when, when um, Borash was in the ring. Um, yeah. So anyway, I, you know, I, I Don West is, is, was the best ever impact or TNA commentator for me, but Don Callis is very, very quickly getting up there. So I actually think that the, the commentary team at the moment is pretty spot on. They're getting a really nice relationship up there, but I suppose if I could have a, a wish, I would most probably go for Jim Ross as the play by play guy. And the only reason I'm saying that is because I think that he would bring more viewers to the product. And although it's not really important for the in-ring, you know, product as such, I, I would love for Impact to become a success and, you know, get back to having 500 viewers each week, then 700, then a million. I would love for that to happen and, you know, and, and ultimately become a competitor. I don't think it ever will these days now, but um, I don't think there's anything wrong with the team, but I, I would have Jim Ross and, and Don Callis, and I think those two could have a lot of fun on, on the commentary team together. So thanks for the question, Luke, and make sure that you do keep on leaving us questions. And that's not just aimed at Luke and uh, Richard Cartledge. It's aimed at anyone who is listening. We will pick two each week and do our best to come up with an answer. Right, on to this week's show. So uh, before we start the, the review, the in-depth review part of it, uh, we usually talk about what we thought of it as an overall show. And, and I really enjoyed it. And I know Ro maybe wasn't as high as I was on it. Nah, I, this show, it was all right. I mean, there were some bright spots, obviously. But, yeah, I this was one of those shows that just kind of was just, you know, in between for me. And the viewership this week, the, uh, they it pulled in 276K, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, hey, you know, some weeks we're going to get high viewership. Some weeks we get low. I mean, I don't, like I've stated in the past, I don't always expect every episode to be a home run, but this was just one of those. And I think though, too, I think I'm ready to see these Canada tapings. So maybe that probably played a part in it because, you know, and I hate to be critical of the fans that are in attendance in the impact zone, but that crowd, man, they just seem so just kind of flat. And I think it kind of hurts when it's on television. It just seems so dead. So is it, is it Canada next week, the tapings? No, I the think week after? we got, yeah, the week after. I think we got one more of Orlando. And like I said, you know, I've seen in the past where the Orlando crowd has, you know, really been enthusiastic. And like I said, I don't want to be too critical, but it's just when it, as it translates on TV, you know, you're seeing some of these, uh, you know, crazy moves. And, you know, it just seems like, you know, crickets. Yeah, well, it was funny. I did notice the crowd was bad this week, as it has been some weeks, but there you go. Uh, I, as I said, I, I really enjoyed this week's show, and I thought feuds were progressed. Um, the in-ring wrestling wasn't brilliant this week, which we'll get into in a second. But overall, uh, it flew by, and that's for me, is always a good sign of a show. Although, having said that, the reason why it flew by, I think, is because um, our recording missed off the first five minutes. So um, maybe that's why it felt quicker this week. So, yeah, I'm going to have to let you take over the... Uh, the first five minutes and give us a, a bit of a rundown of the Grado bit. But be before we do that, I'll, I'll read the, uh, you know, always have a, a list on here of what actually happened on the show. So uh, it starts off with Moose entering, uh, talking about getting past Eli Drake, then a preview of Sadal versus Cage, etc. But the first in-ring section was, was Grado coming out with Katarina before getting attacked by Eddie Edwards. What was this like? This was cool just because, you know, we're seeing some follow with Eddie's character. I mean, he's really kind of and it reminded me a little bit, you know, when you're thinking of mid 90s ish and you know, rest in peace to him. But Brian Pillman, kind of that loose cannon character. And we've seen that with Eddie Edwards. He just comes out and just canes the hell out of uh, Grado. And uh, um, then he calls out Tommy Dreamer and then he has the confrontation with Tommy Dreamer that leads to him attacking Tommy Dreamer. So one would assume we're going to get an Eddie Edwards versus Tommy Dreamer feud. And I'm interested to see only what happens next as far as with Eddie Edwards. I think having him being this unhinged character, I think it's helped him. 
but I think what they're gonna what he's gonna have to do I'd love to see him change his look up a little bit you know coming out with the tights I don't think it's gonna match with who his character is at this moment so I'm interested to see what type of changes that he makes to this new unhinged like character yeah so <laughs> for some reason in my mind I'd like to see him come out in uh, I don't know if it's the same term that you use over there in the states but we call it a wife beater t-shirt over here is that what yeah. you call it over there yes. yeah yeah so like almost like um how what's the guy Dean Ambrose dresses in in WWE or did for a long time I, I think that look would most probably suit him uh but yeah I, I think they've done an excellent job with with Eddie Edwards and getting compared to Brian Pillman wow that I, I think you're spot on, by the way, but that is a, a high accolade indeed, because I know Brian Pillman never made it to the top of the card, but certainly for those who remember wrestling back in those days, he was an absolute fan's favourite, wasn't he? I mean, people love that character and, and just love Brian Pillman in general. So getting compared to him, that's high praise indeed there, Ro. <laughs> Hey, don't put all that pressure on me. I was just using that because <laughs> just, just what he what he's become. But it's just been some excellent work because you know when you think about it, a couple years ago, uh, where Eddie Edwards was and you know when he was carrying the world title and you know, a lot of people weren't behind it, and then to see where he is now. And I like that Tommy Dreamer even mentioned. You know, you should be challenging for world championships. So it you, you like to believe once all this stuff culminates. You know, he'll be somebody that I'll be able to throw back in the picture, you know, with this new this new turn. And I wouldn't even say that it's a hill turn. I think he just he snapped. He's lost it. Yeah, well, well, I saw the end of this segment. This is when my recording kicked in, when Tommy Dream was in the ring. And I thought it was done excellent. The one thing that's interesting is that it's almost like, especially with the OVE sections that are on, that uh, he's kind of finished with Sammy Callahan for now. And he's just going after Tommy Dreamer is the way it feels like it's going. I'm sure, you know, OVE will come back into it at some stage. But it does feel like at the moment the focus is Eddie versus Tommy, as opposed to Eddie versus Sammy Callahan. So, but I thought it was excellent, you know. And, yeah, as you say, he, he's pulling off the character very, very well. Really, really like it. And, um, yeah, uh, interesting that Tommy Dreamer, Tommy Dreamer says he's done. Um, we didn't know he's actually part of the roster, but there you go. <laughs> so he, he's, he's He's done with Impact, although uh, he wasn't the fish. I don't think he's ever rested a match in the last year. <laughs> oh, he did, didn't he? He had the, the, the three way, the three on three match. Anyway, um, excellent, uh, excellent, you know, segment uh, to kick off the show, and then we went into uh, a backstage with Don Callis and Josh Matthews previewing the card. So, um, and they, they, they obviously finish on the segment of talking about Tessa versus Kiera, which. Uh, I'm guessing we might spend a bit of time on tonight because uh, I think we've both enjoyed that match immensely. But next up, we had a, uh, a debut. Well, not a debut, a return um, of Rebel versus Tyre. Now, Rebel, I don't know if you... I can't remember who it was against, but I remember her having one of the worst matches I've ever seen in pro wrestling. It was just botch after botch. And in fact, I'm actually going to go look it up uh, after, after this. But um, her coming back, I don't know if it was supposed to be a big deal or not, but what did you make of this? You know, she's really made strides. I mean, that's one, one thing that I like when you get some of these wrestlers that have, you know, been around. I don't know what her status is with the company, but, you know, she's really made strides. When you think about when she first started, she was part of the menagerie. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, she was just, I don't know what she was doing, but, you know, they put her in some wrestling matches and she was just, you know, terrible. But, you know, credit to her. She honed her craft a little bit. And, you know, she did she did fine in here. I have no problem with her. And, and then, obviously, we also get the return of Taya. And this match, obviously, was just designed to give Taya uh, an opponent where Taya could basically run through and pretty much integrate herself back into the knockouts division since you know we haven't seen her in the you know, past month or so and then oh go ahead i'm sorry so i was going to say one of the things that i did like about the match um the match was actually was fine it was it was, it was, it was all right was that uh, they did bring up the menagerie and, and those kind of things uh, i thought that was actually quite good um just without going off off track here but i actually quite enjoyed the menagerie i, I know it was literally a sideshow freak show you know for the circus uh but i've really liked all the segments that they used to do building it up although it was completely ridiculous um it was quite good although rebel was obviously quite poor 
acting and resting at the time. But uh, yeah, I thought she did all right in this, although all she seemed to want to do was split her legs, uh, you know, to do moves, you know, to, to avoid things and just show off her flexibility, as Don Callis uh, commented on there. Now, I think she used to be a cheerleader, didn't she, with the Dallas Cowboys in memory? Yeah. So anyway, uh, as you, I, I cut you off. You carry on. Sorry about the match. Yeah, no, no, it's all good. It, it looked more so of the post-match angle where you had Taya uh, congratulating Madison Rain. So that pretty much sets up a match next week. You know, we've talked about with the whole Madison Rain and where they're going with her. And, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, overreact. We just have to see how it plays out. But, you know, I don't know. That's all I really have to say. Are you looking forward to seeing Taya face Madison Rain? I, I would do if I thought Taya was going to win. <laughs> I just, you know, as we said before, we just get a feeling that the Madison's going to be running through all these people who we like. Uh, the, the one thing I didn't like, and I've talked about this before, and I'll be interested to hear what our listeners think about this as well, is that I don't understand Taya's character. Because she comes over that she's lucha royalty, so you think maybe she's got a bit of South American in her. Then she comes over with this kind of Game of Thrones entrance, you know, or, or, or certainly fairy tale entrance. And then she gets on the mic and she sounds like a spoiled teenage Californian brat. And I just don't think the way that she talks is consistent with the way her character is presented. Even her name sounds mythological. And then she talks like, well, yeah, geez, you know, that kind of horrible whiny you know blonde bimbo and uh, it, it just sort of always finds i find it really strange to me do you find the same yeah i uh when i first heard, heard her speak it kind of i was taken aback by it you know and i mean you know i, I think she's you know, a gorgeous girl you know not that that means anything but i i think what they need what they should probably do with the character is maybe do and we we spoke about this even with sue young have some sort of backstory as to why she's lucha royalty you know this valkyrie give, give us something as a fan where we're like oh okay you know when you just kind of pin something on someone like that and they come out and like you said having the whole game of thrones like entrance and then when she cuts cuts the a promo just comes across as you know stuck up a woman so yeah. to speak so you know thumbing her nose down on the people which, I mean, you can roll with that, but it just doesn't match with the character. So, exactly. I don't agree that's, with you, Jim. So, yeah, that, that's no, I mean, if, if that's who she is, and as I said, I've done the teleconference before, you know, then fine, go with it. But don't build a character that's got completely nothing to do with, with how she talks in real life. You know, go with one or go with the other. Don't try and put both of them together. Anyway, um, as you said, you know, the match was there just really to serve to set up a, a, a match with Madison Rain. But for a part, Rebel was fine in this. You know, it didn't excite me to see her back. Well, uh, certainly didn't excite me in a, in a wrestling point of view. Um, so, yeah, so but she's back. I wonder if she'll feature much more. I'm not sure. So, anyway, moving forward, we then had the flashback of the week. And three of my all-time favorite wrestlers in Impact or TNA, AJ versus Samoa versus Christopher Daniels. And Christopher Daniels, I think, is most probably my favorite of the three on this one. Um, what did you think of this? It just brought me back to this is when I loved AJ Styles. Not that I hate him now or I hated him later on, but during this time, it's something. <laughs> it sounds so weird, but when he used to wear the short trunks, I don't know. He just he. I mean, it's truly phenomenal, and you know he displayed it in this. And I mean Samoa Joe and Christopher Daniels as well. It's a shame that you look at out of all these three under TNA. You know, obviously we'd say AJ accomplished the most. You know, then Samoa Joe, but I wonder why they never really got behind Daniels, where he never got that world title run. I thought he, you know, was more than capable of, you know, was a deserving champion, and it's a shame that they never pulled the trigger on it. 100% agree. I mean, uh, Daniels is my favorite of those three. And what an in ring talent. And, and there's only two things I can think of that possibly were the reason why he was never put on him. One was that. He is quite small compared to the, the other two. You know, he is he is a smaller wrestler. Uh, but I don't think that that's really the reason. But I suspect that at that point, they thought of the X Division as the main title. And, you know, certainly the one with the most uh, 
prestigiousness. I don't know, prestige, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, so so maybe they felt that, that, that you know, him holding on to that title, because he had it a few times in the X Division and, and, and he held it for some time. Maybe they felt that that, that was all that he needed. But criminal that they he never he's never held a world title i know he's held tag titles and and the, and the like but yeah um as you can tell by the first trivia question i ever asked christopher daniels what was a brilliant character another guy i interviewed by the way uh sorry to keep name dropping here i sound like uh tom jones on the voice uh who keeps name dropping people who he's met but yeah i interviewed christopher daniels and comes over as such a cool dude you know i, I talked the other week about moose being the most boring guy i think i've had on a call but christopher daniels was great really engaging had a lot of fun with us um and i don't know if you ever noticed but he's never referred to as chris daniels have you noticed that no you know what they did when he are, was under the in the uh tna he went from fallen angel christopher daniels to just fallen angel then they used christopher daniels then they just used daniels for some reason and then they they resorted back to christopher daniels but I, sorry, just before you go on, I, the, the reason I was going to say was I asked him about this and he said the only reason why he, he's referred to as Christopher Daniels is because everyone else who's got the name Christopher is reduced to Chris. So he says that he always wanted people to say his full name, Christopher, because it, it differentiated him, which is a bit of a strange one. But there you go. That was my little trivia fact there. Now, Carry on. You know, what he was able to do and you know, credit to him, I think I want to say late last year, he ended up winning the Ring of Honor World Champion ship so you know kudos to ring of honor for seeing what obviously tna missed at during the time he of his tenure you know him being able to capture that world championship but he was a phenomenal talent and you know this match you know, i know we kind of got away from the match the match was incredible you know they replicated this match i want to say at a turning point i can't think of the year but this one this was uh this was the stuff i, I want to say this one was unbreakable if you if you guys haven't seen this, you guys need to check this out. Yeah, uh, all of their matches were, were fantastic. Uh, for memory, they also did um, an Elevation X match, didn't they, for one of the titles as well at one point. But uh, brilliant, brilliant stuff. And j just going back to a question that we had last week about uh, Ring of Honor working with with Impact, and you know there may be some connections there, certainly with Jericho's crews. Out of all the people in Ring of Honor, if I could see one of them back, it would be the tag team of Daniels and Kazarian, or even just Daniels. Uh, you know, I'd just like to see Christopher Daniels back in the company. I don't think he's got a place at the top of the card now, but certainly in the tag division, if him and Kaz came back as bad influence, I think they could have an amazing run with Cult of Lee, with, with any of the tag teams. I think they would have a they would be absolutely perfect to have not even a nostalgia run because they could both still go and they're both entertaining you know i just think when they left when they did i, I was gutted but there wasn't much for them to do in, in in impact or tna at that time so to come back now i think that you know you could get a good year out of them feuding with all of those tag teams yeah i i would say uh motor city machine guns i love those guys uh, well, we'll agree to disagree on that one. I mean, they were good, but I mean, I'm just thinking from from promo wise that they weren't, you know, they weren't up there. Not not with uh, bad influence. Anyway, uh, Mackenzie Mitchell, uh, who's still with the company, uh, just so I throw that little dig in there to BQ. <laughs> I know uh, sometimes these things happen. Uh, Mackenzie Mitchell, who uh, was backstage with Matt Seidel, uh, asking him about how he's going to defeat Brian Cage. Uh, so just a, a fairly standard backstage segment anything to add on this one no i thought it's just great i mean you know more and more we see Seidel's hill work it's just been it's really been uh evolving you think about where it started from when he had the spiritual advisor and it seemed directionless now there's some direction with his character it's it's been great one thing i find strange about the whole spiritual advisor thing is that josh matthews doesn't really bring it up anymore he was integral to that storyline and as quickly as he lost the title that's him he, he was completely out of it straight away and you'd think that he would still talk about you know his friend matt seidel or or the fact that he helped him get there but he doesn't seem to drop much on commentary does he about it just i think it was just one of those things they just scrapped it excuse me and just did away with it entirely mm. so after that we then went to what is uh, affectionately known on the spoilers that i read creepy cam with ove and I like the segment, but they really went to town on the makeup for Sammy Callahan's eye, didn't they? It looked like he, I don't, I don't know what, he just got some gunk and threw it on his eye. It looked horrible, but uh, yeah, it was okay, wasn't it, this segment? 
I like what they're doing with OVE. I like these segments that they do. But yeah, once again, this was another 30 second filler, wasn't it? Yeah, but you know what? It's great just because the thing that I like, you think about the past couple of months, the focal point has just been Sammy Callahan. But now we're seeing the Chris Brothers being involved a little bit more. And I think that's what's kind of needed because OVE is a group. It's not just Sally, Sammy Callahan. It's not just uh, the Chris Brothers. It's all three of them. So I like when they have these little uh, backstage videos. And yeah, the makeup, that was uh, some incredible stuff. So just one thing I did like about this segment, by the way, is is in Sammy Callahan's mind, he won the match. And I think that's quite important, keeping with his character, that he's got, you know, absolutely no remorse about anything. And everything he does, he feels like he, he's the winner in it. So I quite like that they, they did play up on that, that, that Sammy felt that he won the match. So that was good. So then we, we moved on to Falabar KM versus The Cult of Lee. Now, how over are these two? They are super over, especially Bar, isn't they? I mean, they, they, they really love love them. Uh, so it's, uh, all four of these guys, as you know, I talk about them each week. But all four of these guys are just such big characters at the moment. And uh, although the, the, the wrestling itself wasn't up to much in the match, it was a really nice middle of the card. We've got 10 minutes to fill and continue some storylines. So I really quite enjoyed this. Yeah, I mean, you know, the you know when you look at the comedy aspect from Ba and KM side, I think this was once again one of these matches just to kind of give Colt Lee a win since you, we just seen them lose to LAX, and you know I don't know if this is the breakup of KM and Ba. I guess one would assume if they are breaking up, then they're gonna feud with one another, but I really liked for them to kind of drag this out just a little bit more. And then if we're going to get them feuding, then fine. But, yeah, there, I don't really have too much to say. I just kind of just took it more as this was just a way for Colt Lee to get their win back. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will say about the, the rolling over the Falabar does and then KM tried to copy it. <laughs> Don Callis, once again, is gold on, on the mic on this one. You know, he's saying about KM doing a horrible role. Uh, and, and it was true. It was pretty poor both times. But, uh, yeah, I, Unlike you, I really hope that they continue with Falabar KM. And although they're teasing a split, you know, of dissension in the camp, I really hope that it is just a tease and, and that they're, they're almost trolling us a little bit and, and they will continue because I think there's legs in this. And let's face it, if the two of them have a feud, neither of them are going to go on to anything better after it. You know, let's just say Falabar wins or KM wins as the bully. I mean, can you see either of them then going on to something different, you know, which is going to be in a title picture anywhere? I can't. So I, I would much rather see the two of them stay as a tag team and continue this odd couple storyline because, uh, you know, it's brought out character for both of them. And, and, you know, as you can see from the crowd, you, you talked about the crowd being dead, everyone. They weren't for this match. They, they love both of them. Yeah, and especially with Ba, I think the thing, and I, I've spoken about this in the past with Ba, and I bring up when you think about when they had the gauntlet for gold and Ba came in, I think during that time Ba was more of a heel. And when he started doing the, where he hits his head, he had the whole audience, was, I mean, the whole yeah, the whole crowd, I should say, was uh, doing the chant with him. And that's when I knew, I said, wow, you know, he's pretty old, pretty much over. I said, they really got to do something with him. And they found something. They found a nice little role for him. So good on Impact for that, for realizing that. By the way, uh, KM and Bar were both on the teleconference this week, which we'll post up on the channel uh, in the coming days. So make sure you check that out. Uh, Bar did say more than just Bar, Bar. That's right, the uh, interview. So he was actually really quite cool. So, uh, yeah, hopefully I'm going to try and get him on a future show because I think he would be a good guy. We've had KM on in the past. So, yeah, it'll be good to see what Fala Bar's intentions are going forward. <laughs> right, OK, we had a recap of last week's segment between Moose and Eli Drake. Now, they really built this up to be a big thing, so that was quite nice that they did go back to it. But then we moved on to uh, the LAX lair with Ortiz, Santana, King and Diamante hanging out. Um, it, I'll let you go first on this one. I mean, just the same things that we've seen. I mean, now, I guess, with Diamante back in the mix. Um, it seems like there's going to be some, a little bit of dissension. I thought, you know, when they all left and when King was sitting in Conan's seat and talking about the world is mine, you know, <laughs> it kind of just left a, left us a cliffhanger that maybe, you know, there's more behind. Like I said, there's more behind to... Conan getting jumped. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I read the spoilers before I, you know, I watched the show uh, yesterday, and when I well read that he said the world is mine, for some reason I had him in a kind of Doctor Evil. <laughs> but 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 when I actually saw it on screen, it it wasn't half as cheesy as it, as it was then written down. But um, yeah, I do like what they're doing with with the change of music in, in, in these segments, and you know, we saw it again in, in the final segment tonight with the X Attacker. Um, but I do like the way that they are producing the stuff. Stuff, you know, with with regards to the sound and, and the visuals, I do comment sometimes about the editing of it. But certainly, the you know they're helping us understand. You know, if, if you're that dumb and you don't see what's going on here, at least the music is helping us know this is a bad guy. He's up to something um, mis mischievous. So I thought it was a good segment. And um, once again, we didn't need to see LAX in the ring this week to to continue that storyline and build it. You know, so well done to Impact. I think they've done an excellent job with LAX ever since uh, they, they were reintroduced. Okay, right. so then so then we moved over to Moose and Eli Drake from a House of Hardcore show in Philly. Um, yeah, this was all right. Um, uh, maybe it's because I'm so low on Moose at the moment that, you know, I didn't think it was brilliant, but it was okay. The one thing that, that stuck out, and once again, is one of my random musings here, but Eli seemed to be wearing different gear. He was wearing trainers this week as opposed to his usual big boots. And I don't know why these things matter to me, but they always I always seem to notice them. <laughs> yeah, I think he wear, uh, wears uh, sneakers and then he wears some kind of padding over them. But I thought the match was good. But my biggest problem, a match of this caliber needed to take place in the impact zone. I don't think you have number one contendership matches for, let alone, you know, for a shot to at the main event at Slammiversary on at other shows, and that's what it kind of for me. This match it just seemed like it it was something that they had already had uh, taped or whatever the case may be, and then they just threw the stipulation on that. So it didn't come across as meaning as important as what they were trying to portray if they would have told you that hey these guys had a match and there was they didn't mention anything about number one contender we would not have thought anything twice i thought leading up to this particular episode i was looking forward to it because i thought you know this is a big deal so i just thought that it was a poor way to have you know poor choice to use that match to be to determine the number one contendership for the impact world title I think you've hit the nail on the head there. You're quite right. This match, when it was actually filmed, you know, there wasn't that stipulation added to it. And it's something that they've done in post-production, you know, just to, to uh, once again, give us a bit of filler for the show and to make it seem important. But, um, yeah, the match wasn't great. It was all right. And um, one thing I did notice was that a couple of Moose's clotheslines really seemed like stiff shots and you know uh, something that i noticed and i thought wow this is good but um yeah it was all right and it's good that they've got a working relationship with house of hardcores that they do because you know some of these matches do look good and certainly the crowd looked lively i just wish i could get the production a bit better you know uh, it, it's strange going from the impact zone where you've obviously got cameras swooping over the crowd and those kind of things to just handheld at, at ringside but you know uh, i'm sure as the the relationship develops you know we'll see something else yeah, so obviously uh, now that Moose has won that match, he's going to be challenging Ares at Slammiversary. And um, are you looking forward to this? Yes, I'm, it's going to be interesting to see because this is Moose's first world title match in Impact. So, you know, it just makes you wonder, is this, and I know I've joked about it in the past, but will they really decide to pull the trigger and give Moose that big nod and put the title on him? it's going to be interesting. I've said it before, you know, I'm torn between the two because I, I think he served his apprenticeship for want of a better word. You know, he's spied at his time. He's held the grand championship, all these kind of things. So I think it's the right time to put it on him. But the reason I'm torn is that I just don't like the guy. And I, I think that hopefully Aries will retain. Uh, I don't... I, 50-50, I really don't know which way to call it because I said, you know, that there's an argument for both. But if I had a choice, I would carry on with Aries and push Moose back down the card. But there you go. All right. Oh, yeah, listeners, what do you think? Who do you think is going to win this match? I'll be Genuinely, I'm really interested to see what people's feelings on Moose are because I am every week I talk about how I don't like the guy, how I find him boring, bland, all these kind of things. So it would be, it'll be good to see if it's just me or if, like, 
Ro, you like the guy. So um, let us know in the comments section. Right, next up we had, for my money, best match of the night. And and actually, I would even go as far to say as one of the best, best, best knockout matches we've had in quite some time. Um, this reminds me a lot, although obviously two very, very different um, kind of opponents, but it reminded me a lot of Gail Kim versus Awesome Kong in the respect that Kiera came out against the bigger competitor and really took it to it at a high pace, high octane uh, level. So I, I thought this was fantastic. Ro, have you got anything? Yeah, in total agreement with you. This was by far best match on the card, best match of the night by far. It's amazing the chemistry that both these wrestlers have been able to build up. And obviously this is, you know, to give Tessa, to add more to Tessa's edge. But Kiera was able to hold her own. And like I said, I hope this is something that they're able to revisit down the road. Because now you can say there, there's somewhat of a rivalry with Tessa getting the upper hand in the rivalry. So, you know, hopefully Impact looks at this. You know, management looks at this. Or creative, I should say. And this is something that they decide, you know, dare I say, bound for glory or so. You know, we get to see Kiera maybe get her comeuppance on Tessa, on Tessa and win the knockouts title from her. I mean, obviously, a whole lot of things have to go, you know, go in as planned. But yeah, kudos to both, both, both of Tessa and Kiera. This was fantastic. I know you said before about you know somewhere down the line you'd like to see these two go at it again and and I I was like yeah okay whatever because I'd never saw anything in Kiera that 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 suggested that she could come out with this kind of performance but yeah the girl was on fire as it says on her backside um, yeah it was this was fantastic really really good stuff and and you know I just sort of put on a few other things that that happened on this as well I thought the commentary team once again excelled in this and and it was a bit you know Kiera is such a star you know the way that she talks to the ref the way that she talks to the camera the crowd all these kind of things she's just got it and and i love the bit where she was you know shouting at the ref you're going to disqualify me but what i like even more about it was was the way that the commentators picked up on this and and certainly callis was 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 on you know tessa's side saying yeah you can't disqualify there's no disqualification match and you know get your hands off the girl that kind of thing which i thought was brilliant the only thing i didn't like was that Josh Matthews also agreed. And and if we're going to get that heel commentator and the play-by-play -play guy, then I honestly think Josh Matthews should have been on, on the side of the ref of this one and saying, oh, he's only doing his job, blah, 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 those kind of things. That's my only criticism of it. But but everyone involved in this w w was just great. And and the finish, the I, I don't know what you call it, but it was almost like a, a swinging DDT onto the um, the chair. looked brilliant. It looked really good. And, and Kiera sold it, sold it really, really well. Yeah, and you know what? What's so crazy is when you think about late last year, because remember when she was signed and Hanaya was signed, and we kept wondering, when are we going to see them? When are we going to see them? I had just thought that Hanaya would have been the one that really got the significant push, and Kier was just someone they brought on board. I thought she would potentially end up like a MJ Jenkins, you know, where they bring her and don't really utilize her, just sign her. And then obviously Hanai gets fired. Then we see Kiera. Like you can tell, they really have big plans for her. And uh, she, she, she's made some strides, man. And I really think her working with Tessa, she's upped her game a little bit. So this is something that I really hope they're able to revisit down the road. I mean, obviously we know where Tessa's going, and you know with Kiera still being the upstart. But I really think they could really have a great feud between these two. One, actually, there was one thing in this match that really, really annoyed me, and it was the fact that Kiara kicked out of Tessa's finisher halfway through the match, that she did the hammerlock DDT right in the middle of the ring, and Kiara sold it brilliantly, you know, and it looks a brutal move, and it wasn't like Tessa spent any big time, you know, taunting the crowd, you know, or, or, or doing it. She covered her pretty much straight away, and Kiara kicked out of it, and I think for a TV taping because this was a TV show, no title on the on the line, nothing like that, to have someone kick out of someone's finisher, it, it, you just should never, ever do that. And I'm amazed that they let her do it. I don't think that she should be put in that spot, you know, of, of hitting the move, because you should always protect, the, the you know, that person's finisher, especially if they're coming in and they're that bully-type character. Uh, I, that, I was really disappointed to see that. I, I don't know if it's something you picked up on or something that you, you noticed or 
feelings on. No, I noticed it, but then that's when I think if you notice with the finish, she did a different variation of the DDT because normally she does, was using the hammer lock. But what she mm. did for the finish, and I guess you could say too because it involved the chair, but with the finish, she had her kind of like of a full Nelson and then kind of like spent her out and hit it. So, I, I mean, I think it'll be okay. You know, obviously, if for the match that they were trying to have, if you have Tessa hit the DDT and and get the three that quick, I mean, you know, it, it would have uh, killed the match. So I think ha the the finish that they went with having her do a different variation of the DDT, I thought it went it went well. So I guess what Tessa I, I, we. I, 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 so I was going to say, I have no problem with the finish. I think the finish was, was spot on, and, and you're quite right. I don't think the match should have ended when it did, but they, they could have done so many things to protect the move, such as, you know, get Tessa up and say, no, I haven't finished with it yet. I'm not going to cover her, or or even do it so it was close to the rope so she got a foot on it, you know, or something like that, you know, so that the pin didn't count. The fact that she kicked out clean from it is what, you know, from a, an immediate pin is what bothered me. Uh, you know, the match was booked perfectly, you know, the length of it, the way it was finished, but that spot in the middle of the ring, there's no way that she should have been kicking out clean from a finisher like that on a TV match. It's, it's, that's the point I'm making. It's not how the match progressed and the finish. I thought the finish was excellent. I just don't like the fact that it, it was a simple kick out uh, of, of the of the move. They could have done so much more creatively to, to explain how Kiera kicked out of that. You know, and as I said, it, it could have been that Tessa got up and, you know, and started, you know, uh, not cleaning dust off her shoulders or, what, you know, or, or something like that. But just to have a kick out of it was, was disappointing for me. Well, it's one of, I think it's one of those things, the last comment I'll add on it is, it's similar to like when you see a guy, um, I'll, use, I'll use Lashley, I guess, for example. I I want to say, was it two Slammiversaries ago? He had faced EC3 and he had hit the spear and I think EC3 kicked out of it. So then Lashley hit the spear off the turnbuckle or off the top rope and was able to get the three. That's why I was saying it looked like if you, if you go back and watch this match... Tessa used two different variations of the DDT. She had used the hammer lock and one. That was the one that Kiera kicked out of. The one that she finished with was different. So that's why I was saying, I think maybe where they're going with her, she has two variations of her move. So she has that hammer lock one. Maybe that's the setup. And then she has the the finish, the one that she used to beat Kiera. You know, we have to see. Obviously, we know with wrestlers who debut, they change their move, you know, change your moves constantly. So I'm not really convinced that the DDT is going to be Tessa's move. I don't know what she used before she came on board to Impact. But I, I, I get what you're saying, but I think she'll be all right. I think it would have been a problem more had she... Uh, went and used that same hammer lock to beat her only to see uh, Kiara kick out of it earlier in the match. I, I, I'm going to agree to disagree on this one because you're quite right what you said about Lashley, but that was at Slammiversary. People you expect to kick out of finishes at, 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 you know, at the big pay-per-views. But uh, you know, I, I just think that they really weakened her move because it's such a good finisher as well. I mean, you look at some of the guys, you know, who have finishes in, in the company and then they're not very good. The, the Hammerlock DDT, I, I don't know anyone else who uses it. I've never seen, I've genuinely in 30 years of watching wrestling, I've never seen anyone have that finisher. And correct me if I'm wrong, you know, there might be, you're going to tell me now that uh, her father did or, or Magnum TA did, <laughs> but I, I, I've never I seen any. <laughs> I've never seen anyone use it. And the way that Kiera sells it as well, you know, it looks awesome. I mean, look at EC3's finisher. It was always clunky, the one percenter. Never liked it. Now, but this, this looks like a devastating move. And then within four weeks of Tessa or five weeks of Tessa wrestling in the ring, you know, she, she's lost a Madison Rain and she's had someone kick out of a finisher. And I just think it's it's poor booking. Although everything else about Tessa, they've booked perfectly. This, I, I just didn't like. But anyway, there, there you go. That's why we do the show, so that we could disagree with things as well and, and get our listeners' views on it. But I, I would be really keen to find out what everyone thought about, A, this match, but also that, that spot in the middle of it, which to me, I, I just think was, was was a misstep. Right. We, we had a bit of a, a vignette for the X symbol here, and uh, this was just setting up the fact that everyone knew we were going to see, find out before the end of the night who it was going to be. Uh, whenever they do these things to remind you, you always know something's going to happen at the end of the show. But uh, uh, we'll come on to that in a little while. Let's move on to the Jake Chris uh, versus El Hijo de Fantasma match. Yeah, this came off <laughs> completely random, to be quite honest. Um, 
it looked more to set up the post match angle more than anything. Um, but yeah, I don't really have too much to say, but it looks like we're gonna get uh OVE, well the Chris Brothers I should say, versus Phantasma and then obviously Pentagon came out to make the save for Phantasma. So that should be interesting. Yeah, it's good to see that they're mixing up the fuse and they're giving Pentagon something to do and Phantasma something to do. Uh, OVE have been booked like jobbers for quite some time now, which is a bit of a shame. But having said that, I, I do feel that they are very, they don't feel like they're ready for TV yet for me, OVE. You know, some of the mannerisms is so OTT. It feels like a house show, the way that they 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 act in the ring and outside the ring. Sammy Callan is a different caliber but ove themselves feel like they've gone backwards since their their feud of lax i just feel that at the moment they're you know they're they're just running around with sammy and it's all about sammy and although they're maybe trying to build back up ove this didn't really do much for me um phantasma looked better in the ring this week which is good to see uh but it looks like they might be going down a, a, a mask match because they kept on referring to the fact that they were trying to take off Phantasma's mask. So it looks like maybe that's going to be something to do with the storyline. Yeah, we have to see uh, what happens next. Cool. All right, so let's move on to the final match of the night and the main event. And I'm going to be honest here, you know, I read a lot of criticism of this match, saying that uh, it should have been a lot better, it wasn't very good, uh, all, all these kind of things. For what it was, I actually quite enjoyed it. I, I don't I don't see why the criticism came. I mean, it could have gone another five, ten minutes easily. Yeah, you know, but the way it started off, I have no problem at all. I thought it was actually booked quite well in that, um, you know, Cage was chasing Seidel around and Seidel got some quick moves, you know, to get the upper hand. But no, I thought all in all, I thought for what we had was, was quite good before, obviously, Jimmy Jacobs and Congo Kong came down. You know, they were able to put on an yeah, interesting match. I mean, I've stated before, and I don't want to beat a dead horse with it. Like, I really don't like Brian Cage in the X Division. I think he should be higher on the card. But I understand right now, you know, they don't want to push him in the main event too early. So, you know, and obviously now that we get Congo Kong uh, aligning and Jimmy Jacobs aligning himself with Matt Seidel, that's an interesting wrinkle in all of this. And I, this loss, I obviously don't count part of his streak. Like when we think about undefeated streaks, normally they go by pins or submissions. I mean, there's been plenty of times people have lost via DQ or count out. So like, obviously I don't think the feud between Cage and Seidel's over. I'm interested to see what Cage and Kongo Kong are able to do i actually thought while brian cage was going on his streak you know they, they were gonna have to start getting some of the impact guys to face him and i thought kong kong would be a good litmus test for him so i it looks like that's what we're gonna get and maybe once that ends then we'll see them revisit cage versus Seidel. but i'm sure this isn't the last that we've seen of these two no, no, I think it's it's very good, very good booking. You know, they they kept the title on Seidel, which I think was the right move. They didn't make Cage look weak at all, uh, and they've given him a feud that he can get into and actually seem like he's going to go up against someone who, who is menacing, you know, in size against him and can offer a threat. So I actually really liked the way that this played out. I think it could have done with another five minutes, to be honest, um, the match, because I was just getting into it, you know, and some of the stuff was nice and, you know, I, I just thought it was, it was it was not bad at all, you know, and, and I said, I don't understand the criticism of this match because it, it was just fine. You know, it wasn't spectacular, but it, it was good and it was a good way of getting the title shot off Brian Cage and getting him into something else. Yeah, um, and like I said, that's stable. I'm interested to see. So now we're, you know, I guess we're just assuming that we're going to get this stable. It's uh, Jimmy Jacobs managing both Congo Kong and Matt Seidel. That should be interesting. Now we move on to the final segment of the night and uh, the end of our show as well, where we finally got the reveal of the ex-attacker. I thought this was amazing. I thought this was produced absolutely brilliantly and you know we talked at the beginning of the show whether we thought it was a good show or not and I, I just think that they finished off with a really really great piece of work here i thought i th honestly think this is one of the best produced bits that they've done in quite some time you know we've seen the funeral of rosemary and we've seen you know all these kind of things recently but this was just done 
perfectly in my in my opinion yeah the big reveal um killer cross i i remember seeing him he was on um, part one of the gw gw i'm sorry gfw amped episodes he had faced bobby rude but i like the name killer cross i think that's pretty pretty neat and they really gave him <laughs> right out the gate you know he's had a the biggest angle in impact you know by far in some time with him taking out people so the follow-up is really going to be interesting if i had a fantasy book i would have him feud with some of the wrestlers that he's taken out you know until you're really really ready to integrate him into some big storylines but it's just going to be interesting to see what they do i mean do they try to go the brian cage route and have him be undefeated you obviously don't want to have him losing anytime soon so i'm really interested to see what they uh do but i'm glad that they used the attacker angle as a way to debut someone new not resorting to bringing somebody back from old or somebody that's been gone you know just bringing them back to the roster they really u utilize this as a tool to bring on a new wrestler on board to the company I i'm confused now because you're talking about this killer cross guy i thought that was tito ortiz in the cop off outfit <laughs> no 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 that, you're quite right and what's interesting is that we also got another week of this taping from orlando and this is most probably filmed when they were up in canada because obviously um, i think he starts to i don't know if he wrestles on the on the next card but he's certainly at those tapings uh, that they did in canada so um it's good that they've introduced it before he he appears actually on the show but no i, I just the ending it was amazing just the way he looked at the the camera and said yeah you know you should probably call the police i, I thought fantastic absolutely brilliant way to 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 debut him i, I thought it was, it was so good i don't know what they're going to do next week i don't know whether you know they're going to have some more backstage segments with him but i'm guessing he's not going to be in the ring next week so let us know what you think guys because uh and gals uh about this segment because i i don't think they could have done a debut any better for this guy and as you quite rightly said bro you know it's great that the that you know he's not just coming to the ring a random you know entrance like rebel had or or whatever you know and that they've really built this storyline uh impact genuinely has built the most compelling feuds storylines gimmicks than i can remember in a long time even in, in tna's heyday I, I can't remember such a strong you know character building as they're doing at the moment and, and it's brilliant stuff i love it absolutely love it and i just hope that you know these tapings there, there isn't any more missteps because you know there's a few things that they've done wrong as far as i'm concerned but i, I just think honestly that demore and callis have just turned this company completely around you know it, it's it's unrecognizable from the destination america days and and brilliantly so yeah they've seemed to you know they went back to the basics I, and i always thought and what doomed the company back when even when it was TNA, I think what brought a lot of fans, like I could say myself, was it was an alternative to WWE. You know, and even this even stems back for me back, you know, when I was in elementary watching WCW and ECW, where, you know, it's cool when you're watching various promotions where one offers something that the other doesn't. And I think where TNA kind of got lost was they started trying to be WWE like. And now we see this regime, you know, they're just, it's, they really went back to the basics. They're following, like, we've talked about with don he kind of has that old school wrestling mind he doesn't believe that hill should be getting cheered you know fa those cheers should be going to faces that that's kind of the art of wrestling that's kind of lost just because we've seen so many changes and i know things evolve but some stuff you know that's basic basic is okay and we've seen that that's why i said you know if i had to give them a report card for you know a halfway point of this year i'd give them a solid a i mean obviously and i mean you know a when you look at a is excellent i mean obviously there's some things that can be some fine tuning but overall the product has been solid and it's just been easy to follow whether it's the storylines you know the backstage segments you know some of the things that they're able to do um the video packages just everything is just phenomenal yeah uh, couldn't agree more so um is there a rundown of next week yes um just as far as we know the two matches advertised and one of them i'm surprised they didn't ever I, I think they might have they, yeah they advertised this on the show but uh, obviously, we're going to get Taya Valkyrie versus Madison Rain, And we're getting a tag team title match with 
Z and E defending their Impact Tag Team Championships against LAX. So, yeah, that should be interesting. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny. You, you, LAX gets a couple wins underneath their belt, and then what do you know? Tag Team Title Shot. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's funny that they don't really seem to build these title shots up well. You know, it, it's usually something that's just thrown in, you know, on a segment backstage. There seems no rhyme or reason. And, you know, I've campaigned long and hard for quite some time now to say that there should be some rankings that they come up with. And especially when they're doing all these backstage segments, you know, in front of the blue screen, Don and Josh, it'd be so easy just to have a, a league table up there of some sort saying, you know, these are the ones who are in line. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, um, I think that ranking system that you have brought up, I think that'd be perfect. Then every match would have some sort of purpose, even if it's a scenario where you got a guy or so who's at the bottom of the ranks, you know, you could show them kind of moving up. Because I think that's the thing that we kind of see in, in it's just there, there's inconsistencies with it. You know, for some, they have number one title shots. Uh, matches for title shots and then others we just get the ra random tag title matches I will say and I mean I kind of have an idea not because of no spoilers but I kind of have an idea of how that match might go but I just wonder you know once again I always just say what the follow up and I have faith that everything will work out but I think that's going to be a phenomenal match um, I know you're not a fan of them but I think Z and E that pairing that's something that you know they really found something and i know i know that's something that they they've teamed on the indie scene but as far as their work in impact as a tag team it's just been some incredible stuff mm -hmm. well uh next week's show i, I think will be good because i think as you say that that you know lax are just brilliant in the ring anyway and if this these two teams can click i know they didn't do so well last time i think they have faced each other haven't they uh, because I said the last time they did this, this match should have been brilliant, and it wasn't. I think if they can just hit that groove together, it will be brilliant. So looking forward to that. So just before we sign off, remind us of the trivia question again. Will do. Okay, who am I? Uh, I'll fill in. I'll fill in if you if you haven't got it ready. <laughs> All right. The three clues I'm going to give you guys. Number one, I was a part of one of the biggest groups known in professional wrestling. Number two, I've been a part of three different tag teams who have won tag titles. And third, the move that I use, if you were to get this somewhere and have too many of these, you might black out. Who am I? There you go. So give us your thoughts in the uh, comments section below. As I said, I'll be very impressed if you get this one because I was completely clueless and i could have gone through uh the, the roster 20 times and not have got this one so good luck with that everyone and uh, as we said before first time stopping by hit the subscribe and just make sure you catch uh, impact on thursday nights on pop and on five spike in the uk or wherever it is you are in the world uh you can pick it up on the gwn app and uh give us a thumbs up thumbs down sound like sammy callahan there uh all comments are good but for the time being i think that's going to be us have a great day or